Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I am here with my older brother. Wesley. Today, we're talking a movie from 1981. Piranha 2, The Spawning. What, so wait, what was it? It's Piranha 2 what? <laughs> also wait, known you... as... <laughs> Piranha 2, Puppets on Sticks. <laughs> Piranha 2, Flying Killers. Which apparently is the European release official title. This is James Cameron's directorial debut. Sorta. Wait, what? Hey, I have a, at the top of this review, I have a confession to make. Tell me. I violated my own rule, and I, I didn't watch the first Piranha in preparation for this. <laughs> How do you feel about that? I feel pretty good about it. Um, <laughs> the, the one thing that you do need to know is that the flying Piranhas are a new thing. How do we amp up the drama and, uh, and, and move this thing forward? We give them wings. And put them in salt water, apparently. And, I mean, I guess if they have wings, this makes sense, but they can also just live on land and inside of bodies. <laughs> so a lot of the exposition and explanation for what these things were and why they were, don't you think it came a little bit late? The first inkling oh. we got, it lurched out of the, the body, face hugger style, right? And, yes. and then killed her and then presumably flung itself out the window where it then flopped like Finding Nemo into the sea, like <laughs> like three blocks away. And I was like, how did it do that? We didn't even know when the first one emerged that they flew. That was the first death on land. And we, I think we came into a lot of the explanation a little bit late. And Kelly Ray was very vocal about this movie. She's like, look, it's got a real plot and everything. Where we find yeah. out that the army with the, the fertilized piranha eggs was sank in the shipwreck or whatever <laughs> well in the first the first death was all underwater in the cold open depending on what version you saw right the scuba divers start macking under the water kind of inexplicably and then they get murdered <laughs> i mean it's it set a tone right <laughs> Yeah, I mean, every horror movie's got to kind of start with that cold open, right? To set the tone, to let you know that these piranhas mean business. Exactly, but also the ridiculousness of having sex underwater. <laughs> <laughs> like, Tobey Maguire talked about that upside-down iconic Spider-Man kiss and how water was running in his nose and how it was horrible. Oh, no. In And sex in, in weird places, it looks good on screen, and I guess underwater does too, but I don't see how that's practical. <laughs> I mean, you could have, they could have done it on the beach and still had a murder. She could still cut off his bikini briefs with the knife uh, <laughs> on the beach, but I guess it's just more intriguing underwater. And James Cameron loves to film stuff underwater, so why not? Right. But the reason I said he kind of, it's his directorial debut, is because he doesn't consider it as such. He was hired, the legend goes, because this Greek film producer, in order to get it greenlit, had to have an American. American director's name attached. And so James Cameron came in, he did a bunch of scouting for locations, he created some of the piranha models, shot for five days and was fired. And he was like, what the hell? Like, you know, he's trying to make his name as a director. And so he's like breaking into editing rooms, uh, flying himself back to Rome and to location to see how it's going in post-production and stuff. But a lot of the stuff, I'm thankful to say, I think, w weren't actually directed by James Cameron. And I think most of those include the nudity that were never in his original script. Mm. Now, the script penned by another author, at least credited to another author, I don't know what I'm superimposing of James Cameron on this film, because I'm definitely drawing parallels. Yeah, there's a lot. But I also don't know what is Ovidio, the producer who took over, uh -huh. and what is the original author or the credited author. It's really hard to suss out, but I'm... You can see the James Cameron-ness even in, in parts of this film. And then, of course, he reuses these actors, which is part of his M.O. Um, so I can't help but see 
his fingerprints all over this. I agree. The underwater scenes, it's almost as if he said, hey, look, I like underwater. I can shoot underwater. I can do this. I'm going to make a whole movie about this called The Abyss. And, you know, the, there was the homage to the face hugger scene from Alien when the piranha came lurching out of the body. And, of course, he would do aliens after that. I'm not really concerned about what he did or didn't do. It, it actually doesn't matter what we say. No one has seen this movie, I'm guessing. So we can kind of <laughs> say and do whatever we want. But at least you can point to this is a new director that nobody knew about who met a dude named Lance Henriksen who followed him through, you know, for a good long while. While and they were friends and he was the inspiration for the Terminator. Supposedly James Cameron was so poor spending all his money trying to stay in Rome and get it, keep a, a hand in this uh, post-production that he got all sick and was eating like garbage like that he would steal from b buffets and stuff and like <laughs> bread and junk and then that this is where he had the fever dream for the Terminator and Lance Henriksen yeah. was the original concept for that. We have to thank our lucky stars for Piranha 2 yep. <laughs> because it gave us Terminator. Now so so knowing that it exists, and this might be an unusual inclusion in James Cameron's body of work for James Cameron Month, which we're doing right now, we can thank our lucky stars and we can see that this formed some lasting relationships and this allowed other people to see how hard he worked on his movies and how much creative ownership he takes. Uh, at the same time, once this movie is released and we're trying to review it, this is a hard one to get people to sit down to watch with me. <laughs> Kelly Ray was super resistant. I was like, I got to watch a movie. And she's like, okay, what are we watching? Piranha 2. And she's like, ah, I'm not doing that. So, Is she just not into B-movies or was she? I mean, nobody's into b -movies. I know this. I knew this movie was going to be terrible. But I wanted to. I was definitely curious as to what James Cameron would bring to this movie. And it doesn't help that it's not available to rent or stream. It's available on Blu-ray and, <clears throat> spoiler, YouTube. But this is the kind of movie that some people like to watch. Like, oh, I love terrible movies. They're so fun to rip apart. And I generally don't have fun doing that. But knowing that we had to watch this and being like, okay, well, this is a movie from 40 plus years ago where James Cameron didn't really have control. I just kind of, you know, poked fun at the, the stuff. Like, you should have seen... <laughs> We're trying to get a feel for who the characters are. And it's a real shipwreck. And they're trying to figure out which one it is. Or we were trying to figure out which one the ship really is. And then, oh, they're naked. <laughs> and then we go to another <laughs> scene of weird intimacy. And it's the mom and the son. And, and Kelly's like, he's like 15 years old. And I was like, I, I think that's his mom. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, please let that be his mom. And then... A couple minutes later, I was like, oh, please don't let that be his mom, right? <laughs> because that's really awkward. You should have seen the look on my fiance's <laughs> face watching that scene, like uh, mouth agape and like horrified eyes. Like, what is happening? Oh, uh, especially at the end. Like, I thought he was going to kiss her. I was like, oh, no, God. that got really awkward. Why were they so flirty? And why was she all sexy naked in the bed? And he's like playing yeah. with her in the bed. Oh, it's just so <laughs> weird. <laughs> it was and so all, so all I can think of is this kid found himself in a sexy, nakedy, horror comedy type thing and was like flirting with the actress, who obviously isn't his mom. And so in that way, it's not weird. But on screen, it reads horribly. I mean, their interaction was super limited. He had more interaction with his dad, the amazing Lance Henriksen, than anyone else. Yeah, maybe the girl, but that was all sexy time. Yeah. He captain's daughter where they made out in the in the in the pounding waterfall yeah because <laughs> it's sexier when there's water it's just not practical is what i'm saying that kid was having a grand old time flirting with the older woman actress making out with the young you know half naked chick cruising around on boats like when i could just feel the irony when he came to the hotel and he was like this resort sucks it was like the the most ironic statement of the movie because you could tell that kid is just having a field day. Right. Sex crazed hotel Elysium, club Elysium. <laughs> right. And boobies. But you know what? Because <laughs> because people haven't seen Piranha 2, I think it would be helpful if we did a little synopsis, a little summary to help give our audience context for this film. Go. 
Me? <laughs> so <laughs> it's centered around Sex Craze Club Elysium, where everybody wants to mac with everybody, regardless of age or, you know, how they're related to them. And uh, we're centered around a lady who is giving dive instructions, scuba diving or snorkeling lessons to hotel guests. There's a shipwreck just off the coast where it sank, I think, did it say a couple years ago? And uh, it turns out that shipwreck was carrying fertilized eggs or fertile eggs, as they put it, of genetically engineered, modified, super predator. They weren't piranhas. They were grunion. Grunion, yeah. Four canisters, three were recovered. Right? And so there's one canister down there. And the hotel guests, one of the draws for this Club Elysium is that the people go down and watch the grunion run. Except this year, they're not running, they're flying, and they're murdering. Oh, man. What a buildup. Lots of murders until the grand old grunion Grunyun Run Massacre. Yep, and this is definitely coming on the heels of Jaws, which has a lot of the same themes. And you have the beleaguered police chief or whatever who's, you know, running around trying to warn people, trying to save people. And, oh, look, we're the, the he's the chief Brody character in Jaws. Right, and the smarmy resort manager, in this case, hotel manager. Oh, uh, and I didn't, we didn't get to see that guy die, did we? Oh, good call. I said, that guy's definitely going to die, right? He's way too smarmy, and I don't think we did. But then it turns out, hey, look, the dive instructor's the police chief's wife, and they have a troubled relationship, a la the abyss. And uh, then look, the guy, uh, a head of hair, he's, uh, it turns out he's an insider. Was it head of hair or was it asshole school? One of the two of them. Asshole school. Yeah, was the insider who actually oversaw the project or was involved for the genetically modified guppies or, no, grunion. And then <laughs> what became, the what, I guess, passed as piranhas. And then calamity ensues and people get naked and people are gored violently and there's rubber hands and rubber bodies. And, and they make that, that, that the sound so you nobody can hear it but us. <laughs> and uh and the underwater sound where you see, yeah, well, you uh, see the, the flying bubbles. sound too yeah like, yeah they had the flying sound effect that always yeah. preceded the visual right you always right? hear it first and then you know it's coming but no the people on screen couldn't hear it a lot of dramatic irony in the sound design i kind of characterize this as white lotus meets jaws i think that's something that people can hold on to white lotus is just caricature ridiculous resort people and then there's jaws which we all understand know and love and understand yeah, I kind of characterize this as what Kelly said, which was like, boys like to watch half-naked chicks get eaten by piranhas, apparently. Or fully naked chicks. Direct quote. <laughs> is she saying that Piranha 2, the spawning, is for just young dudes in the 80s? I have to assume so. You know, obviously Jaws inspired and Alien inspired, and then James Cameron went to do Aliens. But we talked in our review of The Abyss about the proving ground that was for James Cameron, things that established his themes, his some of his actors, I guess, and just what he found out he could do and what he was best at, what he enjoyed. And Piranha 2, I don't know that it furthers that, but there were so many things. It, it's almost as though he was on Piranha 2 way back when, and the line of dialogue was looking at Lance Henriksen when head of hair is like or maybe it was it asshole school or head of hair who was the guy that was hitting on the wife tyler sherman he was head of hair who said hey come over here you been to asshole school or something yeah so head of hair was like do you know that robot and i was like hey because he's robots <laughs> Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Good one. Uh, that was one of those. Um, what did you call the joke in Terminator 2 when he sees the silver mannequin? It's a foreshadowing joke or something? Yeah, like a, foresh a preemptive joke or something. Yeah, a preemptive joke. That's great. But for him being the the, uh, the model for the Terminator originally and then pushing ahead <laughs> five years to when he's actually Bishop and Alien, that's kind of a stretch. Did he write that line? Did he get the idea from that line? Like, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, maybe he wrote that on the fly and was like, yeah, this guy's real robotic. And then it inspired all of what was to follow. I'd like to I'd like to believe that. That's super fun. I mean, it was dumb and everything, but there were some suspenseful moments and you just have to get on board with the fact that because those piranhas, they know a lot of stuff. They know in the body, they know how to get back to the sea. They know that they have to crash through the pane of glass. They know to go right for the throat. Like oh, they're going to rip the throats out because that's how you get. Yeah, that's how you stop people. Yeah, you, know, you fly right to the jugular. And so I guess the piranhas were smarter than the people in this movie. <laughs> Like, well, they're genetically engineered. Right. And though, although all those people were just, you know, uh, trust fund wasteoids. What do they say? Let's get fish. 
or we want fish. Or... The, the smarmy hotel guy? Yeah, well, he's the one. He's like, let's go get them. And then they all, like lemmings, like with their scary torches, descend on the beach and they're like, let's get fish. Yeah. Let's get fish. And then they all get murdered. So this is what happens to the teenagers who are camp counselors at Camp Crystal Lake uh, who find a little bit of money or whatever and can go to resorts and be all debaucherous and, and hitting on each other. And that poor young beachfront waiter guy who's like getting fondled by the older lady grabbing his shorts and stuff. Oh, Mrs. Wilson, she was unstoppable. And I expected her to die, too. She crawled under a table during the uh, one of the onslaughts, the piranha attacks and uh, and. We were like, oh, maybe she's going to survive. Yeah, a couple loose ends with the B story or C stories like Mrs. Wilson, um, Mr. What was his name? Raul. <laughs> if, yeah, if it's not asshole school or head of hair, I have no idea who these people are. Yeah, but we got these C stories with Mrs. Wilson, Raul, the hotel, the hotel manager, and that weird couple that was 80 yard for some reason. Oh. Like, like the cutesy couple. The one taking picture. He was taking pictures of her. Do I have to? Oh, the worst scene in the movie. They were like gonna like leave that resort and go to WrestleMania or something. It was so weird. It was bizarro. And then there was the Beverly character who gets with the dentist. You mean Dr. Leo Bell DDS at your service? <laughs> exactly. So these people, we didn't track them to their survival or demise. But you know, the two yacht chicks, they get their comeuppance. Yeah, but they they got their comeuppance because they were so mean to to Bumblebee Bob. Why were they so mean to him? They were just they were so. I mean, there was nothing about what did you call him, Bumblebee Bob? Yeah, he had his like Bumblebee T shirt, and he was all like doofy Aww. with his amateur chef. I seriously because I didn't know what was going to happen in this movie. So when he was rejected and was in the water, I thought Bumblebee Bob was going to turn into like the piranha whisperer and was going to like extract his revenge on these ladies, you know, through the piranha evil yeah, or like become a piranha or something and go after them. I just didn't know where it was going. <laughs> wow. Uh... It was just so sad. It was very sad. They just relentlessly, just mean-spiritedly teased and mocked him and led him on. And I mean, just because you're you're like hot and topless and stuff doesn't mean you have to be mean. So apparently there are different versions of this movie. There was a definitive James Cameron director's cut released. That may be the one that's on DVD. And I don't remember in the version that I saw... Those ladies ditching Bumblebee Bob and taking his food and then getting topless by themselves for some reason. But I know that in some of the research that I did after the fact, they talked about how some of the nudity, nude scenes were shot at the insistence of this, uh, of Ovidio, I think his name is. Ovidio, yeah. yeah and, and, and so I think the version I had didn't, it was either too low res for me to note, or they weren't topless on the boat, which, which suggests maybe I was watching the James Cameron cut. I mean, I guess it was a thing back in the 80s where you did the TV cut and the theatrical cut. So maybe he shot it twice, one with bikini tops and one without. But what I didn't understand about Piranha 2, and maybe this is what makes it more of a serious film, if I can even venture to say that, is <laughs> uh, poor, poor Gabby and his son. That Which was one was sad. Gabby? Gabby was the dynamite fisherman that... um Oh, that King Richard? The King Richard. <laughs> Seriously? Well, he had the King Richard beard for sure. Okay. Hey, well, that that's fine. I don't know if we want to. King Richard associations are weird and like Will Smithy right now. <laughs> so he was a dynamite fisherman, and then the police chief gives him a bunch of grief, and then I guess they're friends. And yeah. then he was helping. He was in cahoots with Tyler, the biochemist, somehow. And then he, but then his son got killed, and then he ended up. He was gonna take out the fish like mano y mano, like with a torch out on the beach by himself, and then he gets done. He gets done did by the piranhas. Yep. That was sad. Yeah, he had he made his billy stand against a predator while everyone else was watching behind the scenes. It's obvious that panes of glass are no no safety measures against flying piranhas, but they seemed content enough to watch his demise from behind the blood spattered glass. <laughs> yeah, nobody came out to help him. No way, man. There's flying piranhas out there. It was crazy that there was no aftermath from the massacre on the beach. She like walks to the boat and it's all quiet in the in the dock. They're not spawning anymore. But why doesn't the National Guard descend on Club Elysium at that point? No, there's no police. There's no National Guard. It's not that kind of movie. They can't afford it. It's not in the budget. 
like once you know, then you just put up mosquito netting around yourself or something and you know that they're coming because the water starts bubbling. It's like the jungle cruise. You know when the piranhas are coming. Or the hippos. But no, what do you mean doesn't have the budget for it? What did this movie not have the budget for? Underwater filming. They had helicopters. They blew up a helicopter. Yeah, they they sure blew up that one eighteenth scale model helicopter. <laughs> Was it a model? I didn't even know. Oh, notice. dude, so model. Like the rotors were barely turning. They like flicked them with their finger and threw it into the water. Really? Oh, I was totally, I bought it. I was like, whoa, this movie's got a bigger budget than I thought. And I looked and it was like 145000 How did they do that? I thought this would have been the tool, right? This would have been the thing where he like lowers the, he sacrifices himself and turns the blades into the water and chops the whole school of piranhas to bits. Or they come flying at him and he, he angles the blades to cut them all down. Nope. He just like jumped in the water and <laughs> let his helicopter crash and got on the other boat. And I mean, it was, wasn't was shot very well, but you have to make allowances. But the ending was kind of thrilling. Like, is she going to get out of there? And she grabs the anchor at the last minute and gets pulled to safety. That was pretty good. It was totally thrilling. And then they're all doing the family group hug at the back of the boat. Yeah. I was moved. There's a <laughs> lot of interconnectedness and, and layers and twisties and turnies in this otherwise really campy movie. Like they, I feel like they really tried. James Cameron really tried. And, and from what I understand, he wrote a script himself, uh, found out there were no loca locations secured and ran around and secured them himself with handshake cash deals and stuff. Like really tried to make this a real production on his terms. But I do think that at heart, it would have been a much better movie had it not been interfered with. Uh, apparently it was cut and recut a number of times. And it was just a matter of what the distributors were willing to to put the, their label on. I think it would have been a really a higher grade B movie for what it was worth that had a little bit too much interference. There's obvious deficits with Piranha 2, the spawning, but really what's wrong with it? Nothing's wrong with it. And for that reason, I'm definitely not going to get an, a nope rating. I, I don't I didn't hate it. It wasn't terrible as long as you watch it, which is hard for me to do in the sort of this is a cheesy movie and I'm going with it because it's cheesy and terrible. OK, at least we established why they fly and why they're so aggressive and, and, and why they live in the ocean. But still pretty schlocky. Sure. I'll give you schlocky. Maybe I'm not. May, I haven't seen enough B-movies. I, I came in with very, very low expectations for, for Piranha 2. Then I saw so much of James Cameron in it that it was kind of fun to connect the dots. And as far as B-movies go, I think the only real failing of Piranha 2 is just how cheesy, non-menacing, and non-scary the monster is. Like, for a monster movie, you kind of can't get more ridiculous than Flying Fish. And, like, if these people had, tr like, a shred of intelligence, they could protect themselves pretty easily. It, it's always the Raouls of the world that kind of muck it up and, <laughs> uh, you know, lead everybody to, to disaster when they just choose to put profit over protection of their guests and their people or stuff. But, like, other than the super cheesy monster, the story is kind of intact. It does have a real plot, and it has some thought behind it. I was a little bit put off by how cheesy it looked in some part. I mean, they have the restrictions. This movie was shot, budgeted for 500000 and Lance Henriksen maintained only 300000 of that was used. So who knows where the other cash went? Uh, apparently not to James Cameron or apparently not to a script polisher or to a cinematographer. But, um, I mean, it's got the things for the people who need it. For It's got the science, conspiracy, government tampering thing it's got the boobs and the butts for the people who are in it for that it's got the gore definitely got the gore for the people who are into the gore that stuff in the in the morgue was shot in a real morgue on location with real bodies none of which are on screen but it was freaking the casting crew out and they were pretty liberal with the bit up bodies and junk and uh i mean not as not as much as the remakes do you remember the uh, piranha resurgence a few years ago no. It, it wasn't direct sequels, but there was Piranha 3D, and they topped it with Piranha 3 Double D. Oh, no. I never saw any of those movies, and I saw some, uh, you know, some alluding to them in the research that I did, and those are really gory and also really booby, obviously, as evidenced from the title, and all that stuff was represented, but uh, this was just under the constraints of budget. But it has all the hallmarks of the same cheesy sex 
horror genre that's always been weird to me. Horror comedy genre. Yeah, but I mean, the horror movies that I loved, there's body horror and things like The Fly and The Thing and, and those kinds of movies. But the ones that I didn't like were the sex ones where the teenagers, the horny teenagers get murdered. Uh, Friday the 13th isn't my favorite. A Nightmare on Elm Street was, but it wasn't quite as salacious or obviously cheesy. That stuff dates really badly. I think the bottom line here, a lot of great things from Piranha 2, The Spawning. Maybe it is best left adrift at sea. <laughs> um, you can pinpoint specifically the advent, the emergence of Lance Hendrickson, who went on to do what exactly? Notably for James Cameron, inspiration for The Terminator. He ultimately got a detective role in the police precinct shootout. And then, of course, was Bishop in Aliens. Went on to do a number of sci-fi things and on the TV show Millennium, and we love him, and he's great, and, and you're older than he was in this movie. Yeah, he's really young. He's really young, and I could totally see how he would be an inspiration for Ed Harris's character in The Abyss. And then Trisha O'Neill, maybe the first embodiment of the archetypal James Cameron female hero. Yeah, I can get behind that. And also made an appearance in Titanic. I, I saw so that. So they stayed in touch. But you didn't recognize, I mean, this is all on paper, right? You didn't be like, oh, look, it's her from Titanic, did you? No, but when I saw it in her filmography, I was like, oh, cool. I can't wait to see where she was in that. Man. I think she's kind of sort of in that because she's only credited as woman. But apparently they stayed in touch. So that's cool. And then, obviously, The Fever Dream, which is outlined uh, really well and in a, in a great narrative uh, way in Cadence 13's Blockbuster. The story of James Cameron, which I definitely recommend checking out. The, the overall story of James Cameron, the whole series is great, but the episode's dedicated specifically to the Piranha 2 experience and, <laughs> really? and James Cameron's first emergence. You know, really great, you know, narrative retelling of not only the Piranha 2 experience, but also the fever dream, which of course resulted in um, some of the best moments in cinematic history. So a lot to thank Piranha 2 for. You know, you could see this experience as being part of his formative experience, one that he lo he really considers Terminator, uh, the first one, his actual directorial debut. But yeah, undeniable hallmarks and, and the fact that those are sustained throughout his career are indicative that he has a very clear vision and a skill set that he tried his best to enact here. So do you recommend Piranha 2? I mean, come on. Look, I watched it for free on YouTube because I tried to do my due diligence. I had read that it was available on iTunes, and it's not. I was told that it was available on YouTube, and I intended to purchase. And stumbling there, I found a cut that was serviceable for the purposes of this review. And I was forced to go that route because I didn't have time to get a DVD in hand in time to watch it bring it to you guys for James Cameron month. I did what I had to do. And if that's your experience, if you need to watch Piranha 2, go for it. It's on YouTube. Definitely do the one that says 1080p Blu-ray, because that's the only way you're going to get a manageable viewing experience. Would I recommend it for free if you got time? Sure. Especially in the scope of James Cameron's work. I didn't even consider that I had to give it a rating, even though I just prompted you for yours. Piranha 2, for what it is, and for what it means to James Cameron's growth and emergence as a filmmaker, sure, I'll give it a good. <laughs> eh, it was I wouldn't go that far. I, I saw it and I, I liked seeing the external experience of James Cameron and how it influenced Piranha 2, but that movie in itself was not a good movie. There was too much. I can't give Ovidio any credit for his contribution to cinema, so I'm going to go with a whatever. But like I said, I didn't hate it, and that usually drives my nopes. It was schlocky and dumb and I guess fun at times, but uh, Piranha 2. I'm kind of glad he doesn't consider it his directorial debut. Hmm. So I should get you the DVD for your birthday or Mother's Day is what you're saying? <laughs> I recommend Piranha 2 as the way to fully round out your James Cameron experience. I'm surprised to sum it up from a with a whatever from Wes and a and a good from Iris. That's that's a bit of a role reversal there. For Piranha 2, the spawning, also known as Flying Killers, available, I guess, on YouTube. And on DVD. And on DVD and apparently Blu-ray. Thanks for listening to our review on Piranha 2, The Spawning. We hope that you've enjoyed this James Cameron Month experience. Please subscribe to our podcast. Please follow us on social media. Please give us a call and leave us a voicemail at 818-835-0473. Email us at orwhatevermovies at gmail.com. Our last and remaining James Cameron Month episode is... The Almighty Titanic. Da -na -na, da -na -na. Wait. <laughs> 
No, that was Terminator. <laughs> wow, really mixed up there. What's the theme song? Uh, for, for Titanic? For it's Titanic. Uh, My Heart Will Go On. Oh. <laughs> Titanic, next week at Or Whatever Movies. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.